Welcome to Syntax. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Front End Happy Hour podcast. Welcome to this week's JS Party. Live from Shipshape Studios, this is Whiskey Web and Whatnot with your hosts, Robbie the Wagner and me, Charles William Carpenter III. That's right, Charles. We drink whiskey and talk about web development. I mean, it's all in the name. It's not that deep. This is Whiskey Web and Whatnot. Do not adjust your set. Whiskey Web and Whatnot is brought to you by Wix. We're big fans of Wix here on the show. We've had Yoev and Emmy on before on episode 98. If you're interested in more about Wix, definitely check that episode out. But I'm here today specifically to talk to you about the new Wix Studio. Digital marketers, this one's for you. I've got 30 seconds to tell you about Wix Studio, the web platform for agencies and enterprises. So here are a few things you can do in 30 seconds or less when you manage projects on Wix Studio. Work in sync with your team on one canvas. Reuse templates, widgets, and sections across sites. Create a client kit for seamless handovers. And leverage best-in-class SEO defaults across all your Wix sites. Time's up, but the list keeps going. Step into Wix Studio to see more. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Whiskey Web and Whatnot with your one host this time, Robbie the Wagner. <laughs> Chuck is out of town, and he did some without me as well. So we're kind of going back and forth and not having the same people all the time, but whatever. Let us know if you like it better when I'm not there or he's not there. We'll see. We'll see <laughs> who wins that one out. Today, our guest is Chris Manson. What's going on, Chris? Hey, everybody. Hey, you've been on a couple times before, but uh, just in case people are jumping in here and haven't heard your previous episodes, you want to give a, a quick intro into who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure thing. My name is Chris Manson. I work for a company, Main Matter, over here in Europe. I am based in Dublin, Ireland. It's quite late for me, and I reckon it's, <laughs> what, afternoon for you? Perfect time That's to be five. drinking. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, just perfect ended time work, to yeah. be drinking. But yeah, so I'm kind of a bit of an open source fanatic, specifically Ember, which hopefully we'll be talking a bunch about. Well, it seems like with uh, you know a family and working on Ember stuff, there is nothing well, else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Two young kids. It takes up yeah. a lot of your time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, let's have a little bit of whiskey here. Get started. Mm. Let's see. This is, I think we got the... Hopefully we settled on the rye. I forget. Did we get the, yes, yes the bullet, same one. Yeah. Okay. The bullet rye. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. We never confirmed before the call and I was like, oh God, are we going to show up with the absolutely the wrong whiskeys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily I also have their bourbon and like a couple of their other ones. So we would have been fine, but yeah. So this is the bullet rye. It is 95% rye, 5% malted barley. It doesn't have an age statement. I don't think there's any kind of requirements on it. So it's probably, I don't know, two to four years old or something. Like, probably not that old. I know next to nothing about rice. So you're <laughs> educating me today, Ravi. <laughs> okay. Um, it's 90 proof, so it's not too, too hot. A little hotter than your normal standard whiskey. But, yeah, I mean, a rye is going to be a little spicier. Like, if you like scotches, it's going to be probably something you like more than a bourbon. But we'll see. Yeah, let's go for it. Here's here's the question: Are you supposed to use a Glen Cairn for a rye? Isn't uh, this we like use it for everything. For like, I don't think they okay. have a different different one for like different types of whiskey that I know of. It screams Scotch to me having one of these. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think it's technically good for like any spirit. That's because like it keeps the alcohol from hitting you in the face as much, which is like a good okay. good thing. But I smell some uh, cinnamon and maybe like. I wanted to say bananas foster, but I don't know if it's actually bananas or if it's just like the charred sugar from that. Bananas foster? What is that? <laughs> we might have a bit of a cultural difference here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, bananas foster is, it's like you take bananas and liquor and light it on fire and it's like a dessert. Interesting. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Lots of education for me today. Yeah. <laughs> There's um, a very specific smell that I can't quite put my finger on. It's like a, like a fizzy drink of some sort. I can't quite put my finger on it. Yeah, I don't know. I watched a show about Dr. Pepper yesterday, so I'm kind of thinking that, but I don't know. 
this is not quite what I was expecting. Like it was, <laughs> in a good it was way giving me, way. well, in a, in a very good way. So mm. I'm, I don't know much about rice, but like when I first smelled it, I was like, oh, this is kind of like scotch. I like scotch. And I was like, oh, actually it's not. It, it's different. It's very different. <laughs> but it is, it's kind of spicy. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got got some spice, a little bit of black pepper, a little bit of like. Do you know what it is? I think it's like a a fizzy sweet, and I, I don't know if I'm making things up now, but like a watermelon, mm, possibly like a sweety, like a fizzy. I don't know, like a sherbet kind of thing. I could see that. Definitely a little bit mm. fruity and kind of fresh. Yeah, like you said, it's not the hottest whiskey. It's or I don't know if it's coming across on the microphone, but I'm a. Just getting over a bit of a cold. And this is kind of clearing me out. This is nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it was uh, Robert Jackson that had mentioned, because he really likes rise. He wants it to like, there's that thing when you drink rise that it just like clears your sinuses. Like it's a special rye thing because yeah. of the spice flavor, I guess. So mm. yeah, hopefully that'll help. <laughs> no, it's, I'm already feeling better. I should have had this days ago. <laughs> I've had I've had it in the press, wait, or in the cupboard waiting for... Uh, waiting for the show and uh yeah we should have had this last week so i could have uh, actually yeah. used it to help me <laughs> yeah well yeah all right let's do our ratings mm. so our rating system i think the last time you were on started at one we have since changed it to be yes. zero based because we're developers and we think that is fun so zero to eight nice. tentacles zero being terrible eight being amazing uh four being middle of the road i won't make you go first so i'll i'll give it a rating this is pretty good. I've had some rise I like better for sure. We like Sagamore the best usually. I think we usually give it like a seven or sometimes eights depending on the one. This I think though is pretty good. I'd like it to be a little bit higher proof maybe. So I'm going to give it a six, I think. I'm probably, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea about rise. Like yeah. this is probably, it's all relative. Say, there's other <laughs> better rise and all this sort of stuff. But I, I think I'm going to have to give this a seven. It's also about like where you are at the moment. Like right now, yeah. if you gave me something a bit more proof, I probably would have been like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> don't yeah. do that to me. <laughs> but uh, like I needed something not too mellow, not too heavy. And this is like hitting me right in the sweet spot today. Nice. Yeah. Caught me at the right time to get a seven. Mm, nice. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll try some more rise uh, next time I see you in person. Yeah, so I can't remember. Were we doing hot takes yet the last time you were on? No, no. I've been listening to all the episodes and catching up as much as I can. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, am I going to have to do hot takes? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do them since we haven't gotten your answers for them yet. They do change a little bit, so some of them are different than you may have heard. But this one is always mm-hmm. the same. In TypeScript, inferred types or explicit types? Oh God, do I have to do anything TypeScript at all? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, I think I'd go for inferred types most of the time. We'll probably get into it a little bit more, but I'm working on very library code. So usually when you're passing things around through different libraries, etc., it's quite nice to not have to describe everything. But as soon as you get to the barrier that's like right at the end, this is what's consumed by your consumers, then it has to be as as explicit as possible. But everything else, just let it be loose, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. It's definitely different for, like, library authors and app authors, I feel like. And, yeah, when you do both, it's hard to kind of figure out the, <laughs> the differences. But, yeah, I think I, I mean, think I haven't sense. been an app developer for a year now. I've been, yeah. like, full-time on Embroider stuff, which is, uh, yeah, very library. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Tailwind or Vanilla CSS? Oh, vanilla i'm gonna have to go for vanilla i'm mm. not a tailwind fan i'm sorry robbie i know it's, you love this stuff but it's okay uh, yeah I, it's, I just, it's pretty split so yeah it's fine like i i have a few use cases that are very specific i'm a bit of a markdown fanboy mm-hmm. and like all of the empress stuff that i've been doing and like you know auto generating blogs etc you don't get a chance to put classes in there so actually, mm-hmm. you need to use like quite broad descriptors of like inside your main, you want H1s to have this margin, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to sure. kind of describe things quite globally. So you can't do that with Tailwind. They so. do have Tailwind Pros. I don't know if you've seen that, but mm. you kind of wrap 
everything in like a div with a class of Tailwind Pros, and then it'll find all the like headings and paragraphs and like apply a it's for like a markdowny kind of thing like that. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, maybe still. maybe try it one day. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a guy I think his name's Kevin. He does like YouTube stuff on CSS, and his tagline is something along the lines of make you fall deeply madly in love with CSS or something like that. And it's just when you see somebody who really knows their stuff, like a real craftsman work on mm. just vanilla CSS, proper CSS, not this tailwind stuff. It can be poetic. Yeah, that's true. All right. Get rebase or get merge. Oh God. Yeah. I knew this was going to come. Oh, I hate the, I hate People who say it depends, but I have a very okay. specific it depends. So I never want a pull request to be rebased or squashed or anything like that. There should always be a merge commit, but your your pull request should always be rebased against main, in my opinion. Because like if you think about it in terms of open source, you're asking for your work to be added to the main repo. Mm-hmm. And your work is this like, you know, wrapped up in a pull request thing. And it should describe how to change from main into the new main. And it should always, or most of the time, reflect what main is. Like you start from main, add a few things, and then get it merged back into main. And if there's any sort of conflicts, never merge main back into your pull request because everything just gets really hard to follow. Yeah, it should be a rebase. It should always be a rebase in that case. Yeah, I just hate the merge commits personally. Like, it just seems redundant to me to see, like, merge to this thing, and then right under it, this thing. But <laughs> So <laughs> I understand, and that's totally legitimate, and I've done some tooling recently that, like, looks at your your commits, and it would be nicer if there were only squash commits on main and if you use merge commits you can do git log or all of the git commands and say first parent and it's as if you did a single squash commit on main everything mm. looks as if it's a squash commit so first parent is your friend that means everybody can be happy you don't need to worry about looking at all these messy commits and stuff all right keep that in mind let or const? Oh, this is a new one. I haven't had yeah. time to think about this one. I think it doesn't matter. <laughs> Isn't there some weird thing where, okay, fine, we look at it and it's like, we decide that you can reassign or not, but the actual JavaScript engine doesn't perform any differently under the hood. I think there's some sort of weird trick that it's not, a, it like literally doesn't matter. But I don't know. I'm yeah, that, a... that sounds right. To me, I'm not sure what the internals are like or really why you would choose one versus the other. I've always just chosen const for things that aren't supposed to be reassigned just for that visual cue, regardless of what JavaScript is actually mm -hmm. doing. I've always been fine with that, but there's there's something that's been going around where everyone's like, use let for everything. And I'm like, why? I haven't looked into the whys, really, but I threw it up as a hot take anyway. <laughs> well, it's that's the thing. If the JavaScript engine doesn't, differentiate why should we i think i use let for most things and then when is lent complains at me because somebody set up the you haven't changed this you should use const i just do fix all errors in files mm -hmm. boom and whatever you just do the thing oh yeah yeah prettier is the best because <laughs> i could not do anything where i have to change everything manually <laughs> yeah but not on save i will never do pretty on save I always want to be in control of when it changes the file. Sidebar on the left or right in VS Code? Oh, oh God. I paired with somebody recently that had it on the right, and I felt like all my foundations were, like, falling underneath me. I couldn't <laughs> understand the code that I was looking at. It's like, oh, God, put it back on the left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one's weird to me, like... I, I don't yeah. feel strongly enough to ever move it. Like I would just get rid of it entirely probably before moving it to the right. 
Just seems weird. But. Yeah, I sometimes do that. Like if I'm on a screen and I'm looking at two files that are quite wide or zoomed in or something, I, I do the command B to remove the sidebar. But oh, the right hand side. It gives me shivers <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, let's see. What do you think about nested ternaries? Oh, God. <laughs> they are the worst. Back to your previous point. Let. Just use let. Let result equals first ternary. And then use that result in the second ternary. How yeah. hard is that? It's all going to be optimized away anyway by the whatever compiler. It's not going to help anything to have nested ternaries other than confuse people. I mean, I can barely read a single ternary, to be honest. And then you get you get a couple of levels <laughs> yeah. deep, and I'm just like, I'm not even going to try. I'm going to convert this to like a switch statement no. or if else's or something. Let's see. This is one that is not really a hot take that's like been going around uh, tech Twitter necessarily. But I wanted to get your take on like, do we actually need SSR at all? So this is something that matters to me quite a lot because I work on Empress, which is mm -hmm. the Ember's version of ViewPress, etc. With like, you know, not to be biased, they're like much better name. Empress is just a cool <laughs> name. I didn't come up with it. Somebody else came up with it. And I'm like, yes, let's do that. I think we definitely need SSG. I think that's very important. We we have a thing in Ember, Prember. So you pre-render your Ember app. SSR is questionable. I know LinkedIn, who used to be a big Ember house, they did server-side rendering, but they didn't do it for the app itself. They executed the Ember app on the server side just to do the data pipeline. So they used Fastboot, which is like the Ember's version of SSR, just to do the data aspect of it. And I've seen some hmm. people come up with these kind of hybrid models where it's like, let's not do the rendering part. Let's do this kind of uh, pre-population of the data so that it gets into, again, an Ember thing that we call the shoebox. So it's like, a little piece of meta information that's rendered into the HTML with JSON data that can be extracted out. So the as soon as you load your app, you don't have to then go and get more data. It's a valid thing to do. And if you need that sort of thing, great, wonderful. On the flip side, like, you know, you see Next and Nuxt and all these sort of, what do they call them, meta frameworks. They're obsessed with SSR. <laughs> and it's like every single app needs SSR. And, you know, I know you love Apollo. Is it Apollo? No. What's it called? Astro. Astro um, yeah. That's the kind I of say, I like, don't love Apollo. <laughs> no, it's, you don't like Apollo. No, it's the other A framework. Yeah. And it's like, if you're going to do this sort of stuff, why don't you just do SSG? Like, mm -hmm. compile things when something changes. And if you need something to be dynamic, well, maybe you need a single page application maybe it doesn't need to be SSR like it's yeah anyway yeah I, I guess it's a long-winded that. way of me saying no <laughs> it's the answer yeah because like you know if you go back to the roots of the internet everything was HTML and like mm. it was supposed to be static and then if you had something that was interactive you use a little bit of JavaScript to make that thing reactive yeah. or whatever I like that Astro goes back to that and I think people doing yeah. all SSR are kind of like going the complete opposite direction of like it's kind of static but it's like still all from the server and it's just weird there's like it's too complex for no reason i feel like and and that's the thing like the complexity budget right now is just through the roof and i see it all the time when i'm mentoring like juniors or intermediates like you can see them having to do all this mental gymnastics to figure out oh, what am i doing and where and I've run this JavaScript. Is that running on the server? Is it synchronizing with the front end? And like, come on now. We have a few mental models that we can give people. You know, you have an index HTML file that has HTML in it that's in a folder and the server serves that. You know, you don't need things to be as complicated as they are these days. Yep. I don't know. That's old man yells a cloud <laughs> situation going on. Yeah. Yeah, somebody was talking about that. It actually might have been on our podcast, the one I wasn't on, the episode <laughs> that was most recently out. Uh, 
like yeah you used to just ship like you would type some things and like just say render this and it'd be like okay now it's like you want to get your front end going you need like 50 tools you got to install everything mm-hmm. you got to get your linting you're prettier you need your your vite your uh i don't know just a bunch of stuff and it's like you could just write html though <laughs> yeah but that does bring me to build tools in general I know that you've been working a lot on embroider stuff and I think like one of the bigger things that people traditionally have thought about Ember is like, you know, it's big and bloated and like has a large API I don't understand and like they're intimidated and it like had a lot of magic that didn't work with like Webpack or Vite or different things or tell me about the evolution that we've been moving towards making it all just JavaScript. Yeah, so there's a lot to cover here and I recently did a talk about this at EmberConf. I resisted. I resisted when I was writing the talk going too far into the history, but it's kind of hard. You know, Ember's been around for 12 years now, 12 Mm. years. And there's so much history. There's so much stuff that you have to talk about. Why do we do it this way? Well, we did this way because we started doing this eight years ago and it was the same way. Like Ember CLI... Anybody who uses Ember or has ever used Ember looks at Ember CLI and goes, whoa, this is amazing. Any Angular developer probably feels the same way, but they don't know that they feel the same way because they didn't know that Angular CLI was a fork of Ember CLI. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the same code. For, I think, a few months at the beginning of Angular CLI, it depended on Ember CLI and our downloads spiked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is quite funny. I find that yeah. interesting. But someone anyway. had said, like, it even said, "There's an error in your Ember application or something." Like when it errors, <laughs> <That's> very good. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, I think somebody as soon as they found that, it was like find and replace, delete all the Ember <laughs> stuff. But the the point here is that okay, fine, we have been around for a very long time, but that doesn't mean that we need to be old and clunky, etc. But there's a second point here, which is code that you wrote five years ago should be expected to continue working. That's essentially the hard part of the work that I'm doing at the moment. Robbie, I'm, I'm explaining something to you, but you probably know all this because you're a big Ember head anyway, but I, well, I'll do it for the... people might not know, so yeah. Well, this is my point. I'll yeah. pull up the, the third chair and kind of explain it a little bit. Ember CLI was based on a technology called Broccoli. And Broccoli was great. I actually am a super Broccoli fan, but it was kind of hard to understand because it... It was this abstract idea of describe your app in terms of trees. And that's why it was called broccoli, broccoli tree. Simple pun. But the whole point of it was that you have your app that you write in your Git repo and it gets ingested by a broccoli tree. And then Ember CLI would add different pieces to that tree as it goes through a series of layers. And some things that could be added to it would come from Ember CLI itself to do like the app boot and things like that, or from add-ons. And like us Ember people, we know what add-ons are. They add seemingly infinite functionality to your app in weird and wonderful ways. But the way that it's able to do that is at every layer of a broccoli tree, you can change everything one layer down. You can kind of intercept any code and change it in any way you want, which is super powerful, but it's very hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And when ESM started coming out and people started wanting to do fancy things like dead code elimination or tree shaking and this sort of stuff, like if you don't import a thing, it doesn't get into your bundle. The idea of a broccoli tree and all these different layers of files that were kind of like overriding each other didn't mesh with the new way of like you interpret your app in terms of like you go through each of the imports one by one. What Webpack does, what Rollup does, like bundlers do that. They start at the top of your app and they see an import and they quote unquote do something with that import. What they do is based on like a billion plugins all installed and very hard to understand, but it's the same sort of idea. You get to intercept the import and do something else with it. So there were a few efforts to try and bring 
dead code elimination or tree shaking to Ember CLI the old way. And it was practically impossible. So Ed Faulkner, who is a certifiable genius, <laughs> came up with this idea of embroider, which was like a bridge between the old way and the new way. And what it does fundamentally or under the hood is it takes your code as written and all of your add-ons, all your dependencies, your Ember dependencies, and it rewrites them into a, a format that something like Webpack can understand. Like there's so many <laughs> caveats in the sentence that I just <laughs> said, because it's way more complicated than just that. Yeah. But it means that as soon as you swap to embroider, you get all of the good things of modern build tools because Ember apps are well structured. You have like the same root structure, your root opinionated. Thank you very <laughs> much, Robbie. You're my backup act here. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> because we're so opinionated in Ember, we're able to make decisions about your app that other frameworks aren't able to make easily, essentially. So we can say, oh, okay, you're doing, we're cutting out all the stuff you're not using. That's the dead code elimination. But we can also do root splitting because we know your app is likely split up into roots because that's what Ember apps have done. That's how they're written. So we can add that automatically and every Ember app can like suddenly become much smaller because you only load for every root that you load the things that are consumed in that in that route. It's phenomenal to think how far we've gotten with Embroider to be able to convert old apps that were literally written 10 years ago and have them work in modern build tools. Yeah, I think the equally impressive thing is you can make V2 add-ons that will work in old stuff. Like it, it's all compatible like backwards and forwards, which is insane because yeah. you like, upgrade one angular version and it's like oh you can't use this anymore <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah. other frameworks don't try this at all and that's like people forget it's it's not a sexy point of like oh it'll work with your code from eight years ago like but yeah. that is a sexy point when like you don't have any more money for more developers you're doing the best you can you've got tons of tech debt and you need it all to just work and you don't have time to like upgrade versions every five minutes like that's yeah. a huge selling point it's particularly interesting what you just said about this V2 add-on, because like, I find it very hard to have this conversation with other JavaScript framework people because they don't have a concept of V1 add-ons and we're mm -hmm. already on V2 and we're on this like, oh, new and improved, better for the build system and still equally embeddable in your Ember app. But everybody else is still on the story of, you've got an NPM package and you just import the thing and then explicitly use it. Whereas on yeah. Ember, we like V1 add-ons, okay, fine. They were powerful, but they were too powerful. They could literally change everything about your app in any way it wanted to at any time. That's too much power. Like, <laughs> and that's the whole point of what the, the V2 spec was about. It's like, okay, let's write down exactly what an add-on is able to do and what it's not able to do. And let's draw a line that in itself is a new concept to most frameworks. It's not about downloading an NPM package and then using it explicitly. It's about installing something and having it integrate strongly into an Ember app in such a way that everybody can use and everybody who's using the same add on uses it in the same way, which I think is quite powerful. Yeah, it's definitely different in every other framework. I don't think there's anything that comes close to that. And like the testing story, nothing comes close to oh. it. Like, don't you get wanna, me started. Like, <laughs> yeah, you can't even like render things barely in React. It's like use Jest or uh, I guess Vtest, like, which is basically Jest. You know, it's th those are good packages, but I I need want to be able to see the thing, pause the test, yeah. and look at it and go, oh, this is like the wrong text. That's why my test is failing. I don't want to have to be yeah. like. Let me just console log everything and hope for the best. Yeah, no, it's like when we're having this conversation where both of us in the room, we know what Ember's testing story is like. But I always talk to Ember people and I say, hold on, don't talk to other JavaScript people 
using phrases or terminology that we all accept as given because none of this is accepted as given. Right. Like we use generators in Ember. Very few other frameworks use generators. Like you generate a component in Ember, Ember generate component, component name, and it instantly creates a integration test that renders that component and checks the contents of it and gives you ways to interact with it, to click it, to check the contents and encourages you to put more tests in that file. That in its own right is like a good enough reason to be, oh, wait, hold on, let's try Ember for our next project because a testing story as strong as Ember's will really save you a lot of time in the long run. But when it comes to add-ons, when you generate an add-on, again, generators, it automatically generates a GitHub actions config that tests your add-on in the last two long-term support Ember versions to make sure that anything that you're writing can work for older apps yep. or older uh, people who are using older versions of Ember. There are 20 things in the sentence that I just said that just don't exist in other frameworks. What do you mean long-term support? What does that mean? Like every four versions of Ember, we do a long-term support version that has essentially 12 months of bug fixes and security updates. So you can, when you're upgrading, you don't need to go on every Ember version. You can jump from long-term support to long-term support version. So like that's a whole concept that we could go into, but we probably don't have the time. <laughs> you're generating an add-on and it's automatically adding tests to GitHub CI to test older versions. This is miles ahead of other concepts, other frameworks for this kind of add-on concept. I'm obviously very biased when it comes to Ember and I want more people to use Ember, but frankly, people steal this idea. This is something that everybody should be doing. And I don't know why after 12 years of Ember, somebody else hasn't stolen this idea because it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's, it's hard is the, why no one's done it. There's so much that you would have to do to build like as full featured of a framework and people have tried to duplicate pieces of it, but those things maybe don't get a ton of traction or whatever. And mm -hmm. so there's no like full featured, like, you know, next JS is arguably probably one of the most full featured react things. Um, I guess I haven't tried remix myself, but heard good things mm -hmm. about it, but like neither of them, I feel like cares about the entire, the entire stack of like testing, some kind of add-ons, ways to install things, doing your build configs, routes, and like, they're all missing some piece. I don't understand why people, well, I, I have a th couple theories, but I don't understand why people don't want to use Ember. And I think part of it is like, they think it's old and like not cool mm. and they haven't heard a lot about it maybe. So people want, like, everyone's using React, so everyone else uses React. Like, this is a big thing I talk about all the time, that it's just, like, it's the, the self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy of just, it's cool, so we use it, and we use it because it's cool. And, like, yeah. you know. But React hasn't put out, I, I haven't looked recently, but last I looked, I hadn't put out a release in, like, over a year. And, like, there's oh, that's some... that's interesting. Yeah, there's stuff that's come out in Next.js, like they have, cause they have like the canary, canary, canary version of React that's like, you know, don't really use this, but we, sh we can cause we're Vercel and we know how to, it works. And that has like the React server components and stuff. And like people are all hyped up on that. I'm not sure why, again, comes back to like, why do we need server side rendering other than everyone got really comfortable doing it how they were doing it. So we need to change it now so that we can make you do different things and like still be relevant and mm -hmm. cool and hip. You know, it doesn't matter what we do, I feel like. And Rich Harris had mentioned on his episode, he was like, what, what did he say exactly? Something about like, uh, I posted a clip about it and it was, uh, it's like he always talked about, you know, this thing is so much faster. It's performant, it's like whatever. And like, no one cared. Like, why would we give a shit about like yeah. it working well? But then he was like, okay, actually it's easier for you to use. And they were like, oh shit, yeah, I'm on board now. Like, so I wonder if like, we need to lean more into that of like generators being nice and like the testing being built in and like how easy it is for them to use versus like how fully featured it is maybe. I don't know. 
weird weird nuances there but yeah but they're important nuances we have this fatal flaw in the ember ecosystem which is that we have never not once in the history of ember had a developer advocate there's not ever been one person a single person who was paid just to hype people about ember and that is mad if you compare it to other frameworks oh, yeah. like for sell that's their whole job they want yep. people to get you know mad about next they want people to be like oh this is great let's develop our next thing and next google has this whole program about oh, what is the, what do they call it open source advocate or something whatever it is as long as you use any of the google open source projects and a lot of people use angular they can get paid trips to go to conferences and paid hotel stays and stuff but that's literally never happened for ember not once yeah i mean i Which guess that's mad. the the blessing and the curse of not having one big company that has been consistently behind ember the entire time like yeah. we've had some big ones come and go but they always come and go <laughs> so yeah we don't we don't build up that momentum as easily or have that big pile of cash to send people to conferences well, so this is changing, and this is one of the things I want to chat about. You know, I'm I'm very much into the embroider situation mm -hmm. right now. I work for Main Matter. You know, anybody in the Ember ecosystem will know us. We have done a bunch of add-ons and like pretty popular add-ons. Mm -hmm. But Ember has you know not kind of succeeded on the hype train, and that means that the Ember projects have been a bit harder to come by recently and there are a few companies out there who are struggling to get up to newer versions and things like that and every single one of those companies wants newer more modern build tools mm -hmm. so my boss uh, marco went around to a bunch of these companies and was like right i've got an idea let's all chip in and let's get embroider over the line what does that mean embroider has been out for like five years it's something that people could opt into, but it's not been the default yet because it's just not quite ready. And there's a few a few technical decisions that makes it a little bit hard for people to like justify it being, if you generate a new Ember app, this is the experience that you'll get. Mm -hmm. While there has been a good plan of like how to get there, we needed a monumental effort. And when it comes to open source, monumental efforts like that take two, three, four, five years. But we didn't want that. And Marco right. was like, right, we can do this in a year, but we can only do it in a year if we can get two people full time on this project to get it over the line. And what does that mean? That means embroider is the default. New modern build tools for an Ember app is the default. Not only is it embroider as the default, it's Vite as the default. Mm. So love that like big apps that are taking 15 seconds to rebuild. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that makes people think, hey, Ember is old and clunky. That is not really acceptable anymore. Nowadays, you need it to be instant and mm -hmm. Vite gives you that ability. So we started this embroider initiative where a bunch of companies, I think like upwards of 30 now it's a huge amount of companies all chipped in all different layers like tiers different amounts and i've been able to work on getting embroider to be the default experience in ember with vite for the last year and we are very close like we are days slash weeks from it being ready for mm. people to seriously consider as a production solution for their ember apps which is kind of cool <laughs> you think it'll be the default by emberfest yes it will be the default by emberfest all right you heard uh, it here <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's literally my job to make it the default by emberfest if it doesn't happen from a political reason like anybody who doesn't know the ember ecosystem we have this process called the rfc process a lot of other places have taken on an RFC process. Actually, a lot of them explicitly say that they were inspired by the Ember process, which is interesting. It will definitely be accepted 
by Emberfest, whether or not it's recommended, which is the, the step where it's actually happened when you do an Ember new and it generates a Vite, a Vite app. But when I say accepted, as in the plan and the implementation will all be done, it's just a matter of getting it over the line at that stage. I've used Embroider some. So like when I worked for Apple, we did all Greenfield new Embroider shiny things. So I'm like familiar with it from that mm-hmm. aspect. I haven't been as successful at integrating it into older stuff, but I know it will like technically work with like 328 up, I think, or I don't know if that's going to change when like the new stuff hits, but that's interesting. We on embroider, we have a split at the moment. We have a stable branch and we have a main branch. And if you look at the change set for the main branch, it is huge and it's all breaking changes left, right and center. It's mad, but the current situation is that Embroider Stable supports 328. And for any of the non Ember people in the world, we do a new release every 12 weeks. Is it 12 weeks? Oof, Six I don't weeks. know. I can't, I can't remember at this stage. <laughs> it's pretty frequent. Oh, God. Yeah. It must be six weeks, isn't it? Oh, I am not showing my Ember. Yeah. Six, six to 12. At the moment. Uh, yeah, it's all relative like to sometimes it's not on those dates exactly, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a release train. We do a regular minor release. 328 is two majors behind right now. We are on 5.9, which released last week. We are going to be on six within like a few months. Mm-hmm. So 328, having this whole thing support all the way back to 328 is bananas like nobody else would do something like that but ember deeply cares about backwards compatibility having this work all the way back means that people who are stuck on an old version because of reasons whatever the reasons are they're not left behind the new vite app at the moment it only supports ember canary so that's Mm, not even the released one okay (laughs) big jump (laughs) but that's that's right now so the plan is get the Vite thing working on Canary. And that has a whole bunch of like interesting ramifications. For example, did you know that the latest Ember source was compiled with Vite? I did not. Did you hear about that? No, yeah, that's so cool. So actual though. Ember source, the Ember.js repo itself is now using Vite as its internal build system. Mm. And for anybody who thinks of that and goes, oh, that's not a big deal. Vite's a build system. The amount of weird, not quite ESM module stuff that we have had in our build system for years is just colossal. Mm -hmm. Because Ember was built before ESM was a thing. And we started using modules before ESM was a thing. So our modules were not quite the same as real modules and our dependencies were bundled, but not really bundled. And it was like a total mess. So making it so that Ember's source itself was built with feet, colossal effort, finally across the line. And it also means that the packages in Ember source are much cleaner now. So the Vite app that's consuming those packages is like using real packages. It's using real ESM modules that work properly and don't have odd circular dependencies and things like that. So, so that's why it currently works with only Canary, essentially. Okay, so uh, derail you for a second here. So I think this actually might be a benefit, and correct me if I'm wrong, that because we haven't had real modules really until now, we don't have to worry about this like ESM versus CJS stuff. We can just be like, it's ESM, we're good. Like, <laughs> Is that true? Or yeah. There, I guess the dependencies <laughs> you add in, you have to worry about, because they could be either, but... Uh... Oh, I wish I could say that it was as simple as that, <laughs> but it is. Oh, it's so gross. Everything oh, yeah. about what I'm about to say is so gross. <laughs> oh, God. I've had to deal with this for an entire year, and I am mm-hmm. definitely very jaded on that particular point. So if you're not using Embroider, you've sidestepped this entire issue because Ember CLI just like layers files on top of each other, and the thing that stitches everything together is Require.js. So... AMD modules, which means like there's no there's no root splitting, there's no dead code elimination. It's all just in a giant bundle, but defined with like magic strings to be able to communicate between modules. And again, 
inverted commas, modules, not real modules. Embroider had a, a setting, like the, you have these different settings that you can make your Embroider app more and more static, so it can do more and more dead code elimination. It had a setting, static Ember source, that would take the Ember source in this weird compiled version and like decompile it into real modules that could be reconsumed as real modules. It was gross in so many ways. <laughs> and if you're using Embroider Stable, your Webpack situation that you don't have a lot of control over because it's like in an internal concern to Embroider, it actually uses the ESM CGS compatibility mode. So it's actually CGS inside Webpack, inside Embroider, inside Ember CLI. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is totally and utterly gross. What we're doing as part of the V process, we're implementing this thing that we call inversion of control. So instead of Ember CLI literally calling Webpack as a library after it's done with all its broccoli madness, what we're doing instead is first for Vite, having Embroider be a plugin for Vite that anytime as I said before, you come to an import that's a very Emberism import. Embroider is able to answer the question, what do I do with this thing, in a way that works in a backwards compatible way, with hopefully all the way back to 328 once we're finished with this process. So Embroider, instead of calling Vite, which I'm not entirely sure you're able to do like properly, Embroider becomes a plug-in to Vite. So the control is the other way around. Vite's in control. It asks Embroider questions when it needs to know answers. And we're going to implement the same thing for Webpack so that you can have a Webpack config that's yours that has a little Embroider plugin in it that whenever it needs to figure out Ember things, it just asks Embroider, hey, you said you wanted to import this root module or this root entry point. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> you know, and we're able to answer that question. Yeah, that does sound like the correct way to do it, I think, because then you're it is you're so more just better. JavaScript, like you're using the same yeah. Vite or Webpack kind of setup like anyone would use. And then there's just yeah. an extra plugin that tell, like connects the two. Yeah, that sounds sounds good. Yeah. And you know what's even better? Have you ever had the pleasure of trying to debug Embroider stable app like in the browser? Like having to like step through it? I probably I can't remember a, a specific occasion right now, but yeah, probably. So the way that it looks once you're stepping through it, it's all this webpack eval stuff. Mm. So like each of your files, quote unquote, are this giant string in an eval inside some part of Webpack. So trying to find the right file to be able to put a like a breakpoint to see what's happening somewhere in your app was next to impossible. But now with Vite, every module is requested over the network one by one. So if you have a component that's called fancybutton.js, you just filter your network for fancybutton.js mm -hmm. and it's there. <laughs> it's nice. just exactly as you would expect it to be, a file that's requested over the network and you can just put a breakpoint right there. It's so much better. <laughs> oh, it's so much better. Yeah, that's that's been a thing that's plagued me in different ways for all of my web development career, like getting source maps right for built output and stuff. And like, oh, you know, yeah. it's always just like, oh, this is the wrong code. I'm just going to give up for the day. I'll uh, try to get tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, like all of that is just solved in one big movement. Once we move to feed, it's just oh, it's so much better. That's why I'm so motivated to make sure it's the default for everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I think that really, you know, I, I don't know the solution to make Ember sexy again, but I think that will help a lot. People really didn't love Broccoli. Like, it is so complex to mm. debug Broccoli issues. And Vite, I haven't debugged Vite myself personally, but like Vite is like the universally loved, like every time there's a state of JS, it's like, you know, we hate everything, but we all really like Vite. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So I think that'll be really good. Like, you know, that'll bring some people over, I'm sure. I don't know how, the, how we evangelize better, but 
we'll work on that. There's been some conversations in the, the Ember Core teams to try and communicate better. There's a lot of people doing amazing stuff right now, but nobody's shouting about it. I said in one of the core team meetings, somebody should be employed to just write a blog post for every pull request that Ed Faulkner is working on because <laughs> they're all they're all mad, like yeah. really deep, genius level stuff. It's like, oh, I just changed these 10 lines, but it's made the Ember bundle 30% smaller. Like, how does this even work? <laughs> On the same point, I don't want him to stop doing the work. Right. He should keep on the pull requests and somebody yeah. else should write the blog posts about it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I haven't even written any blog posts of my own, but uh, <laughs> maybe uh, Well, maybe one day. Dude, podcasts count. Like anybody doing any kind of media that's shouting about good work that's happening, like it doesn't matter what it is. Like somebody wants to TikTok about Ember. Fire away. That yeah, won't be me. I'm I don't know TikTok. <laughs> that's that's another thing. I don't understand. Well, I don't understand TikTok at all. I'm too old for that. But like, the people that go on there for coding things, I'm like, why? Like, what do you? I, I guess maybe because <laughs> West Boss does a good job of like, you know, here's like a minute or two and like a quick. Oh, did you know about this CSS property or whatever? Like, I, I guess I can kind of see that. But it just feels weird to me. Like, if I wanted to learn a concept, I'd maybe do YouTube or like, I'd probably okay. just Google it to start. I don't know. Let me close that loop for you. <laughs> it's not about learning the thing. It's the same technique that Coca-Cola uses to advertise. You have all these ads everywhere. Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. And it's not to try and convince you that it's good. It's to add recognition mm. so that when you're in the shop, you go, oh, I recognize that brand. And then you buy a Coke. Makes sense. And that's it. That's it. You just need people out there saying Ember. Like just having somebody say the word Ember. Yeah. People that aren't Theo, though. I don't know if well, you've been following God. him. Yeah, don't, yeah I, <laughs> I saw some of that stuff. But like oh. all of his ideas about Ember are based in the 2X series. Like that is so old. That is, yeah. what's well, that, six years old? I, I got very upset the last like thing that everyone piled on to like, a, I don't know, six months ago, maybe it's been a while, but then I'm taking a step back. Cause I, I haven't really consumed a lot of his content and the times I look at some of it, I'm like, wait, is everything he says like satirical anyway? Like, is this actually mm. true? Or is he just like saying shit, trying to get views, you know, like, I don't know. So I don't know if I should dislike him or not. He's shit posting. Like, yeah, he's clearly yeah. shit posting. He loves doing that. It gets you know, people arguing about stuff. It's great. But what he said about Ember, that wasn't a shit post. That was out of date thinking. Ember is this placeholder at the moment for an old framework that's clunky, etc. And that is something that hasn't been true for at least four years. And as soon as the Vite stuff lands, it's going to be the most batteries included framework that's really easy for juniors and intermediates to understand developers that are doing ember can like jump between ember teams mm -hmm. fully understanding everything that's going on yeah. commit to production and day build one. times yeah commit to production day one and build times are going to be instantaneous once we take that last problem off the shelf there is literally no reason for somebody to not try ember anymore yeah so like, yeah, for anyone they who, say the Vite thing is so important, it's like yeah. really important. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who hasn't looked in a long time that maybe saw Ember before and is still listening with us at this point in the podcast, everyone has heard signals are hot. Signals are the new thing. Like SolidJS is cool. SolidJS is cool. I agree with that. But Ember had trash properties before SolidJS was cool. And it's like the same idea. Like, And I think React does this backwards and wrong. You should say what is going to change not assume everything yeah. is going to change and then tell it what's not going to change. That's the, the wrong yeah. way to do it. So like hooks are totally backwards, very hard to understand. The DX yeah. of React has just degraded forever because React didn't used to be terrible. And I don't know, now maybe I'm hurting my brand saying anything good about it, but um, <laughs> like class-based <laughs> React was actually okay. I didn't mind class-based React. Yeah. It was kind of very similar to like older Ember models where like did insert element or like, you know, component did mount kind of things in React side. Like it's very easy to grok. And then it's like, okay, well, classes aren't cool because like we spent 10 years 
getting classes in JavaScript, so we, we can't like them anymore. We got to switch it and like unlock 0. 0.0001 milliseconds faster, something that no one yeah. cares about. But we're going to add like 500x complexity, and you need to learn all these hooks. And like, I don't understand why React won't just die off. Like, it seems so hard to use these days, but people love that complexity. If you don't love complexity, if you like shipping code quickly, and you like only caring about that complexity in your specific domain knowledge, Ember yeah. is absolutely the best thing you could use. Oh, and if you like not having to rewrite your app every two years because something new and fancy has come out, Ember is the thing. Like yeah. We have an eight-year-old app and it runs, it has its problems. But it runs, we have some GTS in there, like the single file. Oh, dude, uh, so like good. We're, all, we're stuck on 328, so we have some things we can't use, but we have a lot of stuff we can use. Like, we can use 90% of the new stuff. It's amazing how much new stuff we can use on an eight-year-old app. Like, I am legitimately trying to make it so that 328 people who are still stuck there for various reasons can use V. The I love The strategy, it. like, right, right now, Vite, the main branch of embroider only supports super bleeding edge ember but once we get it done we're then going to add this backwards compatibility as far back as we can and we are legitimately contemplating doing patch releases all the way back to ember source 328 just to make it so that people can get onto Vite. and that is like nobody else no other JavaScript framework ecosystem is doing stuff like that. They're like, yeah. no, if you're not on the latest, we don't care about you. But that's not what Ember does. Yeah, it's great. I appreciate it because I don't know when we'll be able to get off of 328. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's so much tech debt in an old app. But anyway. But this is the thing you don't have to throw away the app to fix it. No. Like, you can upgrade it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the whole ethos of Ember. Oh, it's yeah. like, don't throw it away, bring it with you. Which we're doing a lot of. We just replace a few components at a time and exactly. wrangle the TypeScript beast. I had to do some like trying to do like a component that takes an argument that then like refers to part of the inside of that argument in that type or something, like some nested generic shit. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I got it to work. So. <laughs> We are over time here, but uh, is there anything we <laughs> missed mention? Actually, I do want to spend a couple minutes because we talked about Vite, but I am curious about other stuff and if we care or not, like Bun, Biome, I don't know, insert hot new thing here that could maybe work with Ember. Are we working on any of that? Good question. The thing that we're doing with the Vite stuff is we are opening it up to integrate with other JavaScript ecosystem things. The weirdness of Ember apps is going to be encapsulated into very specific things that are actually optional. So if you're not using any old add-ons or any of the old Emberisms, you can turn off each of those pieces as you don't need them anymore. With that in mind, if your random JavaScript engine of choice supports enough features for the Ember ecosystem, then fine, you could use those. I don't see why you would. The whole bun situation makes sense. And so does Dino make sense for like server-side applications. Like if you want this small thing that, you know, is written in TypeScript, doesn't run TypeScript, even though it says it like TypeScript support, it compiles the TypeScript away because that's how TypeScript works. You can run these scripts quite easily on the server-side, but that's not the point of Ember. Ember is a front-end framework, first and foremost, and will probably be forever. And Vite compiles in all your stuff into bundles that can be consumed by a browser. You don't need to worry about Bun. You don't need to worry about Dino, unless you're talking about the server-side rendering side of things. But that's a whole other story that we're... I'm going to punt for now because <laughs> there's a whole question about that, whether or not we need the old Ember way of doing it anymore and whether we could just use the platform. Like Vite has a whole server-side rendering implementation that we could use maybe. We're not sure. Anything else you want to mention before we end or anything about Emberfest people should know? I know you said you weren't directly helping with organizing it, but if you want to 
uh, you know, well, hype it up. The only thing about it is that it's in Ireland, and anybody who is you anybody say like it's a bad Ireland thing, and it's ah, <laughs> oh, dude, Ireland's great, but it's very expensive. Oh my god, I was noticing that. I'm kind of embarrassed at how expensive it is. Is it the Ryder Cup? Is the golf tournament between like Europe and the US? Maybe Do you know I don't know golf? anything about golf really. I think we need Chuck for that, do we? Yeah. Yes, he's he's a very worldly <laughs> fellow. But uh, there was a time when that like Europe versus the US golf tournament was in Ireland, and our Taoiseach, which is our Irish name for a prime minister, like their head of our government, begged local industries to not up their prices because all these Americans were going to come to Ireland and see what it's like and maybe we want them to maybe want to come back but nobody listened like <laughs> there's this culture in ireland to like the phrase is chance your arm which is to try your best to get the most out of people and it's it's really embarrassing whenever it happens well, and like i don't fault yeah. them for being business people like i used yeah. to do that as a consultant like you charge more until someone says no right like <laughs> so yeah but it's like when it comes to an entire country essentially taking advantage of people without thinking about, oh, maybe these people might want to come back. We want to take the most we can right now before. Like, anyway. yeah, instead of the long term. You know, yeah, exactly. Like make it affordable, make it this like annual destination. But yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I was looking at hotels in uh, like city center of Dublin and I was like, oh, this is uh, pretty pricey. <laughs> very expensive yeah. yeah like depending on which surveys you look at we're regularly in the top 10 most expensive cities in the mm. world which is yeah i feel <laughs> it on a daily basis oh yeah everyone's feeling it everywhere too with inflation and all yeah. the crap that's going on now yeah it's hard yeah. yeah and we have this whole thing as well where we have a lot of multinationals have their like head offices in dublin because we had this tax break and there was this whole tax incentive where you could like ship your profits to Ireland, then put them through the Netherlands and then back to Ireland or whatever. And mm. you get like massive tax breaks, which means that our GDP is well above any other country in the world per capita because we have a really small population. Mm -hmm. But we're not a bunch of rich people. Like we're a bunch <laughs> of people scraping by. Yeah. But. Yeah. Somebody's making the money, the though. <laughs> Somebody's making money. Somebody's saving some tax. Yeah. But yeah. But it's lovely. Like, people have been reaching out to me saying, oh, I'm coming to Ireland for Emberfest. And I'm like, I don't know what to recommend. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, like, I just live here. I don't know what's good for tourists to come and look at. It, you know? Yeah. We were, we were pretty sure we were coming. And, uh, because we were going to bring the whole family. and But my son was a complete nice. disaster driving home from the lake today for a few hours. I'm like, how are you going to make it in a flight to Ireland, man? Like, that's mm. that's not, not going to be Seven great. Seven hours so, is a pretty yeah. hairy flight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm still hoping to be there, but uh, not 100% sure yet. If you do make it, there's a, there's a bunch of people coming. Something that's happened recently like anytime there was EmberConf in the US, there was always Ember core team meetings the day before. But so yeah. many people have said, let's go to Dublin for EmberFest that we're going to do the same hmm. here in Dublin. So there's going to be Ember core team meetings the day before EmberFest, which is like a first time ever. Yeah. Which is amazing. Cool. Very excited about that. Well, we'll see if I make it or not. But uh, for those that are thinking about going, Seems like it should be a good time. Definitely check it out. I've I've been wanting to go to some of the Emberfests before. It's just never worked out. But this year, it seems like it could work out. We'll see. Well, Ireland is the shortest flight. That's true. Anywhere in Europe would have been slightly longer. So. Yeah. Save save an hour or so. Yeah. <laughs> or a couple, <laughs> yeah, of, depending yeah, yeah. on where it is. But yeah. It's actually, surprisingly, a much shorter flight here than it is back. Because you have the tailwind oh, of yeah. the jet stream when you're coming to Dublin. Yeah. So it's like an hour difference in the flight. Yeah, see, I knew you were a Tailwind fan. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. And this is how we're going to end the episode. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is there anything else you want to plug before we end? 
Uh, yes, actually. I could do a whole other podcast about this, but uh, release plan. Have you heard mm. of release plan? Have yes, I... we are using it for yeah. Shepard. My only complaint and with it straight. so far is I just don't know how to change the main title of the GitHub release. I think it's probably easy. I just haven't looked into it. So it'll, uh, it'll pick I'll the fi- first I'll fix it. alphabetical package you're releasing, and that's the title. I want it to be yeah, Shepard, yeah. not like Shepard Docs or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, you can look yeah. at it. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, it's we very can fix cool. That. We can fix that. Yeah. 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 Release plan. Like if you're asking me to plug, I want everybody in the world to use release plan for any NPM deployed thing. That is, yeah, it's just yeah. so much easier. Don't use yeah. anything else. It's so yeah. much easier. It's like release it, except you don't have to do anything. You just hit merge on GitHub. One of the other uh, Embroider core team members, Novox Populi, uh, loves to say that it's releasing from the toilet framework, <laughs> which is pretty. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's I compelling, agree with the I guess, marketing but... <laughs> message. Uh, yeah, but he, you know, that's it. It works. You can yeah. literally on your phone merge a pull request yeah. and it releases a package. It's great. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> I don't, maybe maybe don't make that the official tagline, but uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, anything else, sir? No, that's it. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks, everyone, for listening. If you liked it, please subscribe. Leave us some ratings and reviews. We appreciate it, and we will catch you next time. And Chuck's not here to go boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> You've been watching Whiskey Web and Whatnot, recorded in front of a live studio audience. What the fuck are you talking about, Chuck? Enjoyed the show? Subscribe. You know people don't pay attention to these, right? Head to whiskey.fun for merch and to join our Discord server. I'm serious. It's like 2% of people who actually click these links. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review and tell your friends about the show. (sighs) All right, dude, I'm out of here. Still got it.